if you picked up a game or two in the last like decade or something, there's a pretty good chance that you've heard of the Mafia series. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the third one would be the most innovative, the most detailed, most realistic, all that stuff, but if you didn't hear it from the hundreds of other people already, it was actually the very first game that still holds the title. In fact, I think it's still probably the most realistic game I've played so far for many, many reasons. I love the story in the third one and almost everything about the second one, but in my honest, humble opinion, none of them can even come close to the masterpiece of the first one. Allow me to introduce you to the city of Lost Heaven. But before that, let me briefly tell you about its history. This is a game that I have quite a bit of nostalgia for, but I'm going to try and discuss it as unbiased as I can. Development of the project started with a small Czech Republican team called Illusion Softworks all the way back in late 1998, codenamed Gangster. It was originally intended to be a driving focused game similar to Driver, but the game went through many changes. They wanted people to experience what they would see in cinemas and have lots of cool action packed camera angles and all that stuff. They even had a playwright check the script to make sure that the writing was done well. It was heavily criticized, but when they brought it to a Czech Republican film director, he read it and ended up enjoying it. For the authenticity of the world, they collected an impressively large volume of literature, photos, and movies on period clothing, architecture, and automobiles. Most of the buildings that they created in the game were according to originals and architectural styles of the period, They'd even archived several thousand photos, studied a plethora of gangster movies that either took place or were made in the 40s, and the designers read probably an entire shelf worth of literature. With work like this, most employees had 40 plus hours sleepless nights. It's insane the amount of dedication these guys had. You can really tell that this game was made by people who truly, genuinely gave a shit about this game, and it really shows in the final product. Initially, it was going to be using their same engine for their other game, Hidden and Dangerous, but they changed to their brand new LS3D engine in order to boast new, improved features and graphical capabilities. One of these improvements was the use of full motion capture technology that was able to capture certain faces for expressions and detect the audio of the dialogue in order to emulate mouth movement, which was very impressive for the time. You'll hear me time and time again talking about how realistic this game is throughout the video, but to prove my point, at the E3 show in 2001, one of the managers of the studio was describing a traffic accident that happened to him so vividly, it took the others half an hour before they realized he was actually describing a scene from Mafia. Originally, the game was planned to come out in 2000, but it didn't if you didn't notice me saying E3 2001. Due to them changing the entire engine, they had to redo most of the things in the game, and it led to it being released two years later. Eventually published by God Games, on August 29th, 2002, Mafia was released to store shelves everywhere. It was ported to the PlayStation 2 in the original Xbox later on in 2004, and featured minor changes that I'll get to later on. If you have the PC version, which I think is the best of the three, and the one that most people probably played, then it came in this small box. To my knowledge, there were some big box special releases in other regions of the world, but here in the US, it only got a small box release like this. Kinda sad, but I can deal with it since this is still a pretty nice looking one overall. The front has a very simple cover that does its job and looks like a gritty film noir gangster movie. It's also embossed, which is a nice touch. The gatefold showcases some screenshots to pique your interest, as well as one of the pre-rendered pictures of one of the members, and if that didn't work, then you could flip it over to the back to reveal some more screenshots and features like driving and combat. The screenshots are all embossed as well as the join the family for some reason. The sides and top all have the Mafia logo on it, and lastly the bottom shows the system requirements. 
This game was years ahead of its time, and in many ways is still surprisingly even more impressive than games coming out today. Once you're done staring at the box, you could open it to reveal this cool and huge Mafia poster that doubles as a map of where it takes place if you flip it over, an awesome manual that looks like a 1930s newspaper, already immersing you into the game's world. I usually preferred cover manuals over black and white ones, but this one fits perfectly with its theme. And lastly, you get the game itself on three sleeved CD-ROM discs. If you want this boxed physical copy for yourself, they're not too too terrible on price and seem to range between $30 to $50 for a mint one. I say maybe $30 at the most should be good, unless you're buying a factory sealed one. That's about the price I paid for mine back in 2014. The console ports included the disc, manual, and even the poster as well. And if you want one of those, they typically cost around 10 to 20 bucks it seems, but I don't think they're as good as the PC original and we'll get to that. If you don't care about physical stuff, it was re-released digitally on Steam in 2007, but due to copyright issues with the licensing expiring with the music or something like that, the game was pulled off Steam distribution in 2012 and as a result caused prices for Mafia 1 keys to skyrocket into some absolute bullshit territory. Like, I'm not even joking, sometimes I would see people justifying, wait for it, $700 for a f***ing Steam key. I could not shove my palm into my skull any harder than I did the moment I read something like that unironically. And you know what the funniest part of that was? In 2017 it was brought back on Steam and GOG for 15 bucks and it's still there. So <laughs> imagine paying almost a grand of hard earned money on something that you could have gotten for $15 if you just waited a little bit longer. Couldn't be me. Please don't ever drop that kind of money on Steam keys. You're more than welcome to if you really want to, but holy shit man, there's really no need for it. You might as well just get a physical copy that's way cheaper and that you could, you know, play whenever the hell you want. Also, the physical version is superior since it has all the original music not cut out like the digital re-releases. So make of that what you will. Now, I never thought the developers that owned the license of this series would care enough about this very first game, but I was absolutely psyched to see that this game was getting a full-blown remake. I saw the trailer within the hour it was put up, and I think I almost teared up because it's not something I was ever expecting would happen. This is one of those games that, while still perfectly fine as it is, would benefit even more with the graphical powerhouses and technological engine enhancements of today's tech. I'm also very happy to say that my good friend Frank, or X the Master X on here, was an absolute chad and pre-ordered it for me because we're both good friends and also for a video on that. So in the next one, I'll be going over the remake's main differences from this one and whether I think that one is worth grabbing too or not. If you went to the original website back in the day, you could see cool things like news on the game, features, characters, cars, downloads, and even a developer's diary where he would log out things that happened through the game's development process starting all the way back in 1998. Or 2001, if you're visiting it in its final days. I'll upload this eventually to the channel if you want to check it out, because it's probably going to be really hard to get a hold of later on. As for my personal story, I got into this game through one of my best friends when I was in middle school. The same one that reintroduced me to Chex Quest around the same time and recently got me the remake of this one like I just said. I don't quite remember how it came up, but he told me that it was an awesome game and was super hyped up for the second one. So I decided to give it a try one day and I didn't really like it at first. I hated the driving and how it handled at first, but I got past it and I really ended up loving the game for what it is. And after a while I even grew to appreciate the realism behind the driving. Spoiler alert if you couldn't already tell, I really, really love this game and would put it up there as one of my all-time favorite Windows PC games. I don't personally like realism in a game usually, because I think that games should be, you know, feeling like games, because they're a sense of escapism, at least for me. But if there's any game that really nails the feeling of realism, not only for the time it came out, but in general, it's this one. It'll always be my go-to when I want to feel 100% immersed in a surprisingly linear game. 
I also think now would probably be a good time to go into the details of everything else. Installation is pretty simple. Just plop in the first disc into your drive, start the installation, and stare at the awesome in-game renderers of the family, greeting you with each member as the installation goes on, and that's it. Simple as that. Well, almost. If you're using Windows 98 through Windows 7, you're pretty much done. You're good to go. But if you're using a modern system like Windows 10, this game will not work out of the box and will instead require a no CD crack even if you're using the original game discs. And this is an issue with the disc checking that's coded into the executable called SecureROM and is completely broken on systems past Windows 7. You could also eliminate the need for going through it entirely by buying the digital re-release of the game on Steam or GOG, but like I said, that one has cut out music, which is a real bummer, because the music is a really big part of this game. And there's one mission, you probably know what I'm talking about if you play this game, that's super painful and annoying to play through. But you can't glitch it unless you're playing on version 1.0, which is only available on the retail disc, so I'd recommend going with a physical copy for this one if you can, because it's worth the hassle. If you're using Steam or GOG, setup is simple and you don't need me to tell you what to do, but regardless if you're playing off a physical or digital copy, there's a weird graphical issue in-game on modern hardware that causes shadows to flicker a lot, so to fix that, you can go to the link in the description, download that, and extract the two files in there to your Mafia directory. Lastly, before you start the game, launch the setup options to pick your graphical settings and resolution, and thankfully this is one of the seemingly few games that doesn't scale the HUD based on the resolution, so this game should work great in 1080p or higher. But for authenticity purposes, I just kept it at 4-3 ratio since that's what I'm used to. After all that is set up, you're good to go and start the game. Make yourself a profile and stare at this very well made and immersive main menu that almost immediately brings you into the game world. I recommend adjusting the default controls to your own liking before going through with it and I'll get to the other stuff later on, so let's just start a game finally. Now, if you're new to the game or third person shooters in general, then I suggest playing the tutorial beforehand. The story and overall writing of this game is, in my opinion, its greatest strength but also its greatest weakness. I love the story and most other people that have played this game do too but I think it might be difficult to fully appreciate this game if you don't enjoy the story, even though the gameplay is great too. The gist is, you're an average taxi driver by the name of Thomas Angelo, who works in the fictional city of Lost Heaven, based in Illinois. Except nothing is normal, and it starts off with him being interviewed by an investigator regarding the local mafia, so you already know something is up there. He's narrating the story of what happened and how he got involved with them, and everything is seemingly average for this guy overall at first hand. One day, he just decided to take a break from his taxi driving, and he was immediately stunned by the sounds of gunfire and these two guys telling him to hurry up and step on the pedal. It's here that the driving mechanics are shown, and at first glance it feels like hot garbage, but that was intentional since the game was focused on true 1930s authenticity, and yeah, we'll get to that. But going back to the story, after escaping, they appreciate his help and the leader Don Salieri decides to offer him a full-time position for the group if he desires, as a thank you for his help. Tommy initially declines the offer, but after going through what feels like an hour of taxi driving, he stops for a break only to get beaten up by the thugs you helped the Mafia get away from the other day. This causes him to reconsider and goes back to the bar to meet Salieri. He offers him some jobs that are difficult for most people, but easily stomachable for him, for some reason, and as time goes on, he does increasingly intense and difficult things. That's the overall story, and I'm not going to get into the rest to avoid spoilers. So while I'm here, let me introduce you to the gang. You've got Polly and Sam, who grow to be Tommy's best friends and brothers in arms. Polly is a typical tough guy on the outside, but is a very emotional and loyal guy inside. Sam is a bit more soft-spoken, but he fits in perfectly with the two. Then you've got Vincenzo, who deals guns. Ralphie, who's good with cars, but everyone thinks is a stuttering idiot otherwise. Poor guy. Then there's Frank, who I guess is the second in command. And last but not least, Don Salieri, the boss of the family. 
There's also a guy named Luigi who's the bartender of the bar, but he's not really involved with the group that much. And then there's the main antagonist and leader of the opposing gang, Don Morello. A sadistic piece of shit. You've probably already taken note of the visuals, which were striking for 2002, and even today I'd still say hold up surprisingly well. The textures might be a little on the low side at times, but everything else is great, especially the facial animations and the overall design of the city. Lost Heaven is situated in Illinois. Despite that, the city's design, as well as its architectural styles, landmarks, and public transportations, are all inspired by a mix-up between 1930s-esque New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. I can't stress enough how beautiful everything here looks. Throughout the game, there were many times on my first, middle, and my most recent playthrough where I just stopped whatever I was doing to stare at the environment. Not to mention on top of this, this was one of the first games that really nailed the feeling of a true living breathing world, complete with NPCs that have their own cycles of things to do, cars that will honk when you drive shittily, signals people make when they turn and stop, people that get out of their cars to walk or go in and out of some stores, cops that randomly patrol the streets, and much, much more. There's life everywhere and there's always people doing something. The city's also filled with lots of autumn looking orange and yellow trees and tons of greenery everywhere. It's such a charming and beautiful game to look at, and I'm not going to go over everything because I feel like this is a world that really deserves the time to be explored on its own. I also like the glass and water reflections, and that's something people don't really even seem to do much nowadays. The game in itself is technically an open world game, but it feels and plays much more so like a mix-up between an immersive sim, a driving game, and a third-person shooter. It has a very slow start, but I personally like this since it helps a lot with the character building and helps you feel more connected to Tommy. People see this as an open world game, but it feels a little bit too linear for me to truly consider it that, if we're being honest, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's no fast traveling, which could make the game feel a lot slower and more tedious to most people nowadays, but I actually really like this since it helps a lot more with the immersion. It's not really needed anyway, since you're really just doing the game mission to mission. If you really want, there are monorails and trains you can ride, so it's not all that bad, although that's a little bit more tedious. There's 20 missions, each of them taking between 10 minutes to an hour if you know what you're doing. If you don't, this will be a very lengthy 20 to 25 hour game with all the main content. That's not including the optional side missions that'll take 10 to 20 minutes from someone named Lucas by going to a shop at the end of the missions after a certain point of the game. They're completely optional, but you can unlock some really good cars if you do them. Most of the missions will consist of you driving to a place and either chasing or evading someone else, or going to said location and getting in some sort of intense third person combat section. There isn't any difficulty selection, but the game is very challenging, make no mistake, even bordering on the unfair territory at times. One of the biggest reasons is the lack of a save system, and instead there's a checkpoint system. This is expected on consoles, but this was a PC game, and for a game this challenging, it really needed a manual or quick save system. Sure, it's tolerable and you can put up with it, but it's really annoying doing lengthy things for the 20th time because you just got shot in the head randomly. Sometimes the combat is kinda hit or miss and seems random even if you shoot someone directly in the head, sometimes you lose a chasing or escaping mission because the AI cheats and goes ballistic, etc etc. There's only a few moments like that in the game, but the most notable mission is the one that everybody always talks about, the infamous racing mission. In the original release of the game, version 1.0, it was nearly impossible since all the other cars were perfect with their turns and handling and super fast, and you had this car that controlled like a wet turd. That's probably the best way I could explain it. There was a way to glitch it if you felt it was a little too hard. You could go through this track, crossing the line a little, and then pressing the number pad zero key to bring you right before this line, and you can repeat this until you finish. If you're playing on the patched version Steam or GOG have, then this race mission now has a difficulty selector, which seems cool at first, but it only helps a little bit, and to make things worse, the area that you can glitch in is now blocked by an invisible wall. There's people that'll say this mission is easy even on extreme difficulty, and I wouldn't listen to them if I were you. 
Those are probably the same people that go to random women and brag about how big their schlong is. It's a really f***ing hard mission. Don't feel bad if you feel the need to glitch through this race, I mean, it's way more difficult than it has any right to be. I do not condone cheating in any way, but I really feel like this one was legitimately unfair. And if you think it's me being a pansy, it's not. This is one of the few, if any times, I've had to glitch through something to pass it, without pulling a Kyle and busting the hole through my wall. There are countless people I've seen say that this race is the reason they've never finished the game, and they have every right to say that. So yeah. I think now might be a good time to talk about the driving in the game outside of this race. I'm gonna be honest, it feels like shit at first. And trust me, I hated it when I first played the game, but it's something you can get used to over time, and the reason they handle this way is due to the devs wanting to make this feel authentic to the time period. Something in which they heavily succeeded from what little I actually know about the era. The second mission just had you driving around for like 15 minutes, and it's very, very slow and tedious and boring. And I'm sure that was intentional to highlight how boring Tommy's life would have been otherwise. But when you get used to it, and especially when you get newer, much better handling cars, driving becomes quite fun. You can shoot in the car if you want to or need to, change the camera angle while driving to get a better view, and you can honk the horn to get other people to move out of the way, although kinda wonky and not always effective. Everything else with the driving is pretty self-explanatory for the most part. There's also a radar there on the side that shows you all the different kinds of cars around you, which you can learn about in the tutorial. A really neat little touch regarding these cars was that to get new ones, you have to have Ralphie or Lucas show you how to pick the lock of that specific model, otherwise Tommy can't steal that car. Unless he just, you know, pulls someone out of the car to commit GRAND THEFT AUTO! Yeah, I love this game. The cars are all very impressively built. If your gas... Yes. <laughs> if your gas tank gets shot, the car doesn't explode, but instead the car is now leaking gas. Tires get shot or damaged, your car now has flat tires and is moving super slow. Your engine gets shot, car instantly blows up. The cars all also get damaged at specific parts, and the texture of that part will change as it gets damaged. When you turn around, you can also see Tommy physically rotate the steering wheel as you turn. Try showing me another game with this much attention to detail, I dare you. In the missions, you'll have a compass to tell you where to go, but you could just do what I do every time I play this game and just pull up the map as you go. I recommend this, because it can let you look for shortcut routes and plan ahead to make your traveling a little bit faster. There is a really detailed cop system, and that also is much more realistic than every other game I've seen. There's no in-game currency, which is fine. I mean, Tommy makes a lot of dough while doing his dirty work, so it fits in with what's going on. You can get ticketed or arrested depending on the offense. Driving over pedestrians, holding a weapon in public, and evading tickets will get you arrested. And when that happens, they'll pull you over to the side and arrest you, and it's basically a game over and you have to reload whatever you did last. If you want, you can shoot them and try to run away, but that'll just turn the cops into bloodthirsty murders that are super annoying to avoid. So... yeah. They can change you to wanted status if you try to avoid them and one of them goes up to a phone booth on foot. Detail. For tickets, you can hit other cars, and unlike, I don't know, every other game in existence, you can also get ticketed for driving over the speed limit and running red lights. And if you weren't already sick of me saying the word realistic every five damn seconds, this will only happen whenever a cop is in the same area and sees it happening in front of them. Not behind you, not from the side or some random distance and having them spawn randomly, I mean, this is all preset. It seems like every NPC in this game has their own little life cycle and just makes the world feel like its own living, breathing entity. I could only imagine how amazing this game must have been when it came out. This was in development way before GTA 3 came out, so this is some really impressive stuff. If a cop on foot sees you doing something you're not supposed to, you can easily just run over him or evade him. But if they're driving, they're really tough to get away from. Sometimes you can just get out of your car and they won't recognize you, which I found really funny. Other times you can steal a cop car and get away with ticketing stuff. Luckily, if you don't want to risk that but you want to avoid the speed limit issues, 
You could press the speed limiter key, which is F5 by default, to lock your speed at the speed limit unless you're going downhill. In the original retail version this was set to 40, and in future updated versions it's set to 60, which I do think is one of the few better changes, even though 40 is more accurate at the time. The third person gameplay is a little interesting. The movement and gunplay feel kind of like a hybrid between Max Paid 1 without the bullet time and Hitman Codename 47. These missions usually have multiple ways to complete a main goal, which is cool and also reminds me of Codename 47. The combat is reliant on your distance and accuracy, recoil is frighteningly realistic for a game of this age, and it's one of the few reloading systems that make every single remaining bullet in each clip count. What I mean by that is whenever you reload your gun, if you still had extra bullets in the clip, then you end up losing those bullets. This makes you think a little bit about whether you want to reload and have more shots to save a little time, or make the extra bullets count and risk reloading later on, and there's many situations that you'll have to do this. On top of that, all of the carnage you caused remains on the ground until you go to the next level. Seriously, corpses and their bloody remains will stay there. If you walk on top of a corpse, you leave a trail of bloody footprints that also stay there. Every time you reload or shoot, the scenery is painted by your carnage of bullets and clips. And the most impressive thing about this? No matter how many bullets you leave, clips you reload, corpses you put down, none of this ever slows the game down. I mean, it's utter black magic how this works. Imagine playing a game like this nowadays. I'm sure the remake will be good, but I have a feeling that they weren't able to pull something like this off. And I can't honestly remember about 3, but Mafia 2 got the remaining particles done right with the physics enabled, but even on newer machines it struggles to keep a steady performance with that. No other game these days that I've played does it. The combat overall gets an A+, and aside from the world and atmosphere of the game, it's my favorite thing about it. It's super satisfying to me, even if a little wonky at times. Making someone blow away from a shotgun blast or unloading a bullet into their skull will never not be satisfying. I'm also not a psychopath, I swear. The combat feels really punchy and you feel like you're the star of some intense action movie or something. Especially when you're in closed areas or outside by bushes where particles can fly all over the place. I mean, look at this. The toughest car focus mission was, without a doubt, the racing one. But I think the toughest mission on foot is the one with the harbor, and I'm surprised nobody ever really talks about this one outside of the YouTube videos that involve it, from what I've seen. It's absurdly difficult, and if you've played this then you probably know what I'm talking about. The first time I played this game, it took me almost an entire day to finish this mission, and this time it took me a few hours because of the checkpoint system. Be prepared for it if you haven't played this game. The game can feel kind of buggy sometimes with the AI just kind of doing its own thing at random moments. Otherwise, usually it's fairly decent and typically crouches behind cover, dodges to avoid getting shot, or runs away when they're out of ammo. It's good stuff. There's also stealth in this game that works kind of the same way as Hitman C47. Like, you have to get directly behind someone even if you're touching them, and then hold this baseball bat back and whack them to knock them out. The missions that pretty much focused on these weren't bad by any means, but they did feel like the most unpolished sections of the game. Especially when touching them does nothing, but they can spot you from all the way across the map otherwise. Overall, the weapons are broken down into four categories, melee weapons, pistols, shotguns, and rifles. Melee weapons consist of knives, brass knuckles, and baseball bats that can be used to knock people out. Pistols consist of cults and magnums. Two-handed weapons consist of double barrel and pump action shotguns, which can send enemies flying and never get old. Tommy guns that fit the era perfectly and you kinda need to use as sniper rifles sometimes, which is weird. An actual sniper rifle, which you only get for one mission, strangely. And Springfield rifles. I liked all the weapons and found them all to be pretty useful, though my favorite of all of them is probably the Tommy Gun. It not only represents the era pretty well, but it's endlessly satisfying to mow down a league of these assholes with it. Also the pump action shotgun, it's never not satisfying seeing someone fly across the screen when you use this thing. 
The voice acting was apparently the best in the original Czech release, but I think the English voice acting is pretty stellar across the board. At least for the main characters, not for the side characters, because, uh... Don't come back here, you'll end up in worse shape than your friends. Everything will be okay. Don't move, scumbag, or I'll fill you with holes. Come on, just try it. You won't get past me. Sure thing, buddy. Uh, just stay cool, everything's okay, just go, no problem. Just try it! Yeah, they, they needed some working. Regardless how good or bad the English voice acting sounds, I do think it fits a little bit more because the game takes place in Illinois, but when the voice acting is good, not only does it sound great and convincing, but their acting is well done and it really makes you feel like you're watching one of those awesome early 1900s crime and gangster movies. The Italian accents fit perfectly too, especially considering, you know, people came from Italy whenever this stuff was happening. And the sound overall is also pretty great. Guns all sound like they pack a punch, explosions are loud as they should be, crashing sounds satisfying for some reason. When you're walking around the city you can hear other people walking around and talking and stuff and it's great stuff. And the music is spectacular. It's easily up there for me and just like the rest of the audio it perfectly captures the feel and atmosphere of the era. And as I said earlier it's also the reason it was pulled from digital distribution a couple of years ago and was re-released with cut music. While not every track is cut, a good chunk of them are, and that's why I said a physical copy is preferred here. I can't play most of the music because of the stupid-ass copyright. I mean, the people that compose this are probably dead by now. I, I don't... I don't understand why this is such a big deal. There's another video on that, and you, you can just watch that. I'm not going to really get into that right now. If you've seen those old 1930s cartoons, which I hope you have, you uncultured swine, you should know what to expect if you haven't played this game or heard the music yet. Well, mainly it's beautiful orchestral stuff, but when driving, different regions of Lost Heaven will play different songs to fit and sound like they're coming from the radio of the car. It's great, very immersive, and very memorable stuff. Also, how did this game only get an M rating for Blood and Violence? Did the ESRB play this game for more than five minutes? Shit! 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 Bastards! Yeah. Okay, guys. Multiplayer was announced and planned during development, but cut out in the final release. Instead, there was a free roaming mode where you could go into the world and do as you please. Here you can pick the city and time of day, population density and some other stuff, load up one of the cars you own, and go wherever you want. This is a great way to appreciate the game world they designed without worrying about the missions. It's nothing huge, but I think it's a great addition overall. For some reason this mode has currency, even though the base game doesn't, and you can make money by doing crazy shit like going super fast and killing other gangsters, and you can use money to buy weapons and heal yourself, and go to Salieri's bar to save your game. On top of this, whenever you beat the game, there's a free ride extreme mode where you get a new set of optional missions and allows for much more extended playtime and new cars, which I found awesome. Tommy has his own house here, which I found pretty cool, and I'm assuming this is what happens between his middle and old ages that had a huge time gap between that we didn't really get to see. It's really a shame about there not being multiplayer though, because I feel like that would have really helped even more with the longevity. Now if you got the game on PS2 or Xbox, the ports are not as bad as some people will make it out to be, but they are largely inferior ports when you compare them side by side. One of the benefits of the console ports is that the cutscenes now look to be in higher quality pre-rendered ones instead of in-engine ones. It's a neat little touch, but there have been some significant cutbacks in-game with the world and how things work, more frequent and long loading times, and just a bunch of other crap. Freeride and Freeride Extreme have now been cut out due to limitations and replaced with a Grand Prix racing game mode, so at least they did have something cool and exclusive here, and it's kind of fun, but I personally prefer the Freeride Extreme modes. Despite the inferior console ports and the lack of multiplayer, the game is still running very strong with a surprisingly large fanbase for a game of this age. Which brings me to the main questions that you've wanted to hear the answers to when you sat down and watched this video. 
Is Mafia worth playing and does it still hold up today? It definitely is, and does, in almost every way. It's actually aged way better than most other games I know from the time. It plays pretty much like an old school third person shooter but with a very cinematic approach, like most of today's games. But unlike a lot of the games that I've played in recent years, this one knows how to perfectly balance the gameplay and the story. That's really the main thing, if any, that I can say is legitimately worth complaining about. Well, aside from the forced checkpoints and the lack of manual saves, but yeah. Due to the game being a linear story-driven game, you play through it once you've pretty much played through it enough. There's nothing different that changes upon multiple playthroughs, although if you're someone like me and you enjoy this game enough, you can find fun in it even after beating it several times. For someone that loves movies like The Godfather and Goodfellas, this is an absolute treat every time I play through it, and leaps and bounds better than either of the other two games in the series. While Mafia 2 was a well worthy sequel to this game, though that's definitely time for another day, also the remake is about to come out like, tomorrow and I'm really excited. But yeah, this one? While it's definitely not for everyone or casual gamers due to its linear and very challenging nature, it is a game that I 100% recommend to old school and hardcore gamers. You better go out and grab it, regardless if it's a physical copy or a digital one. Just, just do it, asshole. Go ahead and have a bag full of holes or what? Thank you very much for watching my review on Mafia, one of, in my opinion, the best PC games ever made. If you liked this video, it'd be cool if you dropped a like or a comment. And if you want, hit the subscribe and bell button to see more in-depth reviews on other PC classics, as well as detailed walkthroughs, obscure black metal and electro-industrial albums that I find, and much, much more. Hope you enjoyed this one, and until next time when I look at Mafia Definitive Edition.